Welcome to Candid Conversation number 629. Uh, let's see, today we're in Colossians chapter 1. We're in verses 24 and 25. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. A lot of people have trouble uh, with verse 24. About He rejoices in his sufferings for you. Well, that, that part isn't the difficult part. I mean, it's difficult to put into practice because no one wants to suffer, but we know from 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, shall suffer persecution. We know from Romans 5, 3 through 5, that the tribulation works patience, patience, experience, experience, hope, and hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So that tells us the tribulations work some good things in us, patience, experience, hope, and God's love. And so since we want to have those things in our lives, then it's a good thing that we go through the tribulations. So we can understand from a spiritual point of view, 2 Corinthians 12 is another one where Paul says um, that he glories in his affirmities because when he is weak, then is he strong. Then when he... <coughs> When he is weak, then Christ is strong in him. And so, you know, we can understand then there's an inverse relationship between the strength of the flesh and the strength of the spirit. When the flesh is weak, then the spirit is strong. And when the flesh is strong, then the spirit is weak. Because Galatians 5.17 says, The flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. So, we can understand from all those verses that it's actually good that we suffer for godly living. That when we allow Christ to live in us, we are in the course of this world, you know, operating in it. <coughs> Satan is the god of this world. And so we understand that if Christ is living in you and everybody else is allowing Satan to work through them through the course of this world, then we are going to suffer. That's just how it is. And so, and the suffering works out God's love, patience, experience. It causes Christ to be strong in me. And so then we can rejoice in our sufferings. When we set our affection on things above, not on things of the earth, then we're going to actually rejoice that we suffer. <laughs> Uh, so, the first part there of Colossians 1.24, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. So we explain that, why he rejoices. That makes sense. But that last part of the verse is what people have trouble with. Fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Now, in uh, the modern translations, they change that to say that they fill up that which is lacking in Christ's sacrifice. That is a poor translation because what that does is it changes the doctrine. It says there was something missing in Christ's sacrifice. His sacrifice was not enough. That's one of the reasons why you have the works in addition to uh, grace, in addition to faith. Works plus faith that all of churchianity believes that you must have in order to be saved. And that goes along with that false doctrine. Romans 11.6 says, If it's grace, then it's grace. If it's work, then it's work. And if you mix work with grace, then it's no longer grace. Or if you, more works, you mix grace with work, then it's no longer work. Grace and works don't mix. And so you can't have Christ's sacrifice paying for 90% of your salvation and then you pay with your own works the other 10% that just doesn't that doesn't work it's either all Christ's sacrifice all 100% God's work or it's 
and, and it's nothing, or it's 100% your work, and God did nothing. Well, obviously, Christ is the one who paid for our sins. He does 100% of the work. But when the modern translations change this verse to say that he, through his sufferings, he is filling up what is lacking in Christ's death and Christ's sufferings, well, then that shows that they believe that there are that you have to do works in order to have your salvation. But that's not what the verse says. The verse says, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. And what that's saying when it says, not what's lacking, but what's behind. Because Christ suffered it all. Once, his sacrifice once for all. And so all of Christ's sufferings is behind. First Peter talks about the Old Testament prophets, they didn't understand about the sufferings of Christ, that's his first coming, and the glory that should follow. That's his second coming. Christ, when he came to this earth, he didn't come to set up God's kingdom. He came to live the perfect life, die on a cross for our sins. He conquered death and hell. That was the, his first coming, was to conquer death and hell. His second coming, he will set up God's kingdom on earth. But the first coming was all about the suffering. So as 1 Peter says, the sufferings and his first coming and the glory that should follow, which ends up being his second coming. That's why this verse says that he fills up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. The afflictions of Christ are in the past. Revelation 1.18, he says, I have the keys of hell and death. He's already conquered hell and death for us, and so all the suffering, he had to make his soul an offering for sin. He is soul travailed. Isaiah 53 tells us that. And so all that suffering for Christ is done. It's in the past. He's not suffering anymore. Now he is exalted to sit at the right hand of the Father. And he is all about now receiving the glory, the rewards for the suffering that he went through. And so well, you say, well, what is Paul talking about? Because Christ already, okay, he suffered on the cross. He suffered in hell, travail of his soul there. His soul did not see corruption in hell. God raised him from the dead. So what's he talking about when he says he's filling up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ? Well, um, Christ, Revelation 13, 8 says that Christ was slain before the foundation of the world, or from the foundation of the world, I think it is, or it may have been before, I don't remember. But basically, when God made the world, he saw the slain lamb, and he built the foundation of the world in the slain lamb. That's the cornerstone on which God made his world, heaven and earth. He made it in the slain lamb. Well, it wasn't four thousand. It was four thousand years or so after Adam was created that Jesus died on a cross. But yet, but because God is outside of time, Romans four says He calls those things which be not as though they were. And so, although historically speaking. Jesus did not die on a cross until at least 4,000 years after God made heaven and earth. Because God is outside of time and he sees everything, past, present, and future, he sees everything. His foreknowledge says that he can build the heaven and earth in the foundation or the corner, cornerstone of the slain lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he saw the sufferings of Christ and used that as the cornerstone of making the earth 4,000 years before Jesus actually suffered. Well, we know for the dispensation of grace, 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. We are the body of Christ. And notice in this verse he says, fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh 
for his body's sake, which is the church. So if we're the body of Christ, and God sees things, calls those things which be not as though they were, and he is able to make the world with a cornerstone or the foundation of the slain lamb, even though Christ doesn't actually die on a cross until 4,000 years later or so, then God can also look ahead in time and also see all the sufferings of the body of Christ. And that could be part of what Christ goes through. But we are his body, so then we suffer. It's just like if I hit my thumb here with a hammer, my thumb is going to suffer. It's the thumb that suffers, but it really affects the whole body because my brain, my thumb sends a signal to my brain that says, ow, that hurts. And my brain tells the rest of my body, we got trouble in the thumb. And so the body concentrates on healing the thumb. You know, people say, oh, my back hurts. Well, hit your hammer, hit your thumb with a hammer, and then you won't feel the pain in your back. Well, in a way, that is true because, um, you know, I've experienced that before where I've had maybe a surgery or some pain, some constant pain that I had. And then allergies, for example. I have, well, you see this morning, I have bad allergies. But if I have some physical ailment, like a bad back or I go for a surgery or something, something major, usually my allergies sort of calm down because my body concentrates on the other thing, which is a more urgent need. And so it doesn't have the time to work on the allergy stuff. And so what that shows that although if I hit my thumb with a hammer, my thumb suffers, really the whole body suffers with it. And Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 12. And since we are the body of Christ, then when we suffer for godly living, and it's Christ living in me, Galatians 2.20 says I am crucified with Christ. Well, if I'm cru the reason I'm crucified with Christ is because I'm part of his body. His, his big thumb didn't get out of the crucifixion. His big thumb was crucified along with the rest of his body parts. So if I'm part of his body and his whole body suffered on the cross, and God is outside of time, and he can see the slain lamb and build heaven and earth in the foundation of the slain lamb 4,000 years before he actually dies, then that tells me that when Christ suffers on the cross and when he suffers in hell, then the suffering included in that is the suffering of his body and hell on the cross and that thing. Those things, suffering of his body, and that's us. So when Paul says he fills up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, what he's saying is that whatever suffering we have for godly living, for Christ living in us, is really the sufferings of Christ. And they're all part of the afflictions that he suffered when he died for our sins. He's not filling up that which is lacking, meaning that Christ didn't suffer enough, but he fills up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ. Christ died 2,000 years ago, so it's behind. And, and so any sufferings that we have for godly living is part of the sufferings of Christ's body, because we are the body of Christ, and it's part of what Christ went through on the cross and in hell for us. Now, I know that's hard to understand because I'm 2,000 years removed from that. But if God says that he built 
the foundation of the heaven and earth in the slain lamb, according to Revelation 13, 8, even though Christ wasn't slain until 4,000 years later. If that's true, then I can also believe Paul when he tells us in Colossians 1, 24, when he says that he is filling up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, then it shows that the sufferings for godly living that we have are part of the afflictions that Christ suffered 2,000 years ago. And what he's doing then is he's filling up that which is behind. Again, it's not lacking. He's just filling it up. I mean, the way I think of it, it's sort of like if you have a glass and you put some water in it and the glass is, it's there, it's full of water, but then you just keep pouring the water in there, keep pouring it on, you're filling it up, you know, and it's always at the top there. Um, that's sort of what I see it as. And so then those sufferings that we do are really, because remember, it's Christ living in me. Colossians 3, which we'll get to in two messages here, it says that Christ is our life of Christ is our life and I live by the faith of the Son of God nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ liveth in me then when I suffer in the flesh it's really Christ suffering in the flesh Christ suffering through me and so that suffering then is part of the suffering which he did on the cross and again I don't understand how that works because I know I'm 2,000 years removed from the cross I just know that God's word is true. He cannot lie. So if he tells me that he fills up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh when he suffers, then I know that that is true. And I know that those sufferings that I face now for God the living are somehow part of the afflictions that Christ suffered 2,000 years ago. Again, I don't, I don't understand it. I just know God is true, and so I believe the verse. But notice it says, fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh. And it says, for his body's sake, which is the church. If he's filling it up, what that tells you there is it has to... Christ had to suffer for our sins, you know, completely. Had to pay for them all. And so all the sufferings that has to do with, with uh, godly living then is part of that. And so, when we suffer then, then we're really suffering for the body's sake because it's not really me suffering, it's Christ suffering through me. And so that's part of the afflictions. And whatever afflictions Christ suffered, he did it for the body. Well, of course, for the bride as well, for Israel. But in Romans through Philemon, the focus is the body of Christ. And so it's for his body's sake. And again, I don't understand how all that works. I just know the verses and I know God's word is true. And so I believe what God tells me here. Now the next verse it says, verse 25, whereof I am made a minister. So he is made a minister in the dispensation of grace. It says, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. So he's a minister of the church the body of Christ, but he's not, you know, Moses was a minister of the church, the church in the wilderness. He's not a minister of the body of Christ. He was a minister for Israel. Paul is a minister for the body of Christ. And so that's why he has to qualify when he says, I am made a minister of the church. He says, as according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. So just like Moses was not a minister to the Gentiles, he was a minister to the Jews. Paul is a minister to the body of Christ, not to Israel and their program. And then the last part says to fulfill the word of God, which tells us that the doctrine, once Paul finished writing his last book, which was probably either 2 Timothy or Philemon, probably 2 Timothy, when he finished that last book, then that fulfilled the Word of God, that completed the Word of God. All the rest of Scripture, including Revelation, had already been written by the time that Paul penned his last word that went into Scripture. Why? Because it says, 
that the dispensation of God given to Paul fulfills the Word of God. So we know that that completes the Word of God, which tells you that the dispensation of grace is for today because that's the most recent. It's to us today. And that also tells us that any speaking in tongues or people who say they have a word from the Lord, any extra biblical revelations are false because it says that Paul's mystery, the dispensation committed to Paul for, to fulfill the word of God. So if it fulfills the word of God or completes the word of God, then there is no more scripture to be added after that. So the last book in your Bible pen, chronologically speaking, would have been 2 Timothy, probably. And that completed or fulfilled the Word of God. There's no more Word of God to be given. God completed it, so then any speaking in tongues or, oh, I got a word from the Lord. The Lord is telling me this or that. It can't be. God isn't speaking that way. Now, you may have a word for the from the Lord for somebody if you're using Scripture, if somebody is lying, then you can use a scripture that says you're not supposed to lie. That's not an extra biblical revelation. It is a word from the Lord, but it comes from the scripture that's already written. The scripture is already completed or fulfilled with Paul's writings. And notice it's connection, connected to the body of Christ. And so when Romans 11.25 talks about the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. We know that that relates to the sufferings as well. The fullness of the sufferings of Christ is filled up with the sufferings that we go through as the body of Christ. And then it fulfills the word of God. I mean, it fulfills the sufferings there, the body of Christ, fulfilling the suffering, and so that brings in the fullness of the Gentiles. Anyway, we're out of time. Thanks for watching.